Tonight, the prime minister calls for patience and peace to end the rail blockade. As the pressure on the government rises. We need to find a solution, and we need to find it now. That was the weakest response to a national crisis in Canadian. Fiery debate, but little movement. Rosie on the government strategy to end the stalemate. Canadians quarantined on a cruise ship wait for rescue, but not everyone can come home. I'm going to be alone and I'm scared. Suck it in, suck it in, hold your breath. One, two, three. The common household cleaners linked to childhood asthma. And it's one of the fastest growing crimes in Canada inside the fight against human trafficking. You see people's eyes light up, um, even for a second, you know, and, and that to me is that's hope. The red flags parents should look for. This is The National. Today, passionate, bare-knuckle debate rang out in the House of Commons. And at the center of it, Canada's national crisis of disruptive protests and rail shutdowns. Some First Nations leaders said those shutdowns have sent a clear message and demonstrators can now step away. So far, no signs of that. You made it personal, John. Protesters blocked the driveway of B.C. Premier John Horgan in support of what Sobotan hereditary chiefs opposed to a natural gas pipeline in that province. Three people were arrested, and today, Via Rail said it plans to resume some passenger rail service on Thursday, even as Justin Trudeau calls for patience. There are those who would want us to act in haste, who think that using force is helpful. It is not. The Prime Minister's speech this morning kicked off the heated debate in the House of Commons. Salima Shivji shows us how it all played out. As the blockades stretch into another day, a sense of urgency takes hold in Ottawa. The pressure is severe. We understand uh, the importance, uh, the economic impact. The Prime Minister pressed to find a way out of the crisis at what he calls a critical time. Patience may be in short supply. And that makes it more valuable than ever. Calling for dialogue as the only path forward. They need to be heard. A message backed to varying degrees by these chiefs. It will be a self-defeating purpose to continue on with the blockade. So I'm hoping that reason and peace are going to prevail. Today again, of course, we're calling for, for calm. We're calling for creativity and constructive dialogue. See. Dialogue as well in the halls of Parliament, with Justin Trudeau looping in opposition leaders at a closed-door meeting. All except Conservative leader Andrew Scheer. He wasn't invited. That the actions of these radical activists are illegal. After comments, the other leaders called unacceptable. The clash dominated the day. Dialogue is not going to pay the bills for people who are facing layoffs. Simple question, on what day will these illegal blockades be taken down? Yeah. Mr. Speaker, the Conservative Party of Canada continues to demonstrate that it does not understand uh, that the path forward is concrete actions uh, in reconciliation, in dialogue. Only it's far easier to promote dialogue than to force a meeting with hereditary chiefs who oppose the pipeline. This has to be at their invitation, as Minister Miller said, that there is not a lot of trust. We're not going to talk uh, with a gun pointed at our heads. And so the partisan lines are clearly drawn. The Liberals have most leaders on side advocating talks. Tonight, the minister had what's described as a long and positive phone call with the hereditary chiefs. But still, no date for a face-to-face -face meeting with some RCMP still on Wet'suwet'en land. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. All right, so let's get some insight here from Rosie Barton, our chief political correspondent. We need a sense of what's happening behind the scenes, Rosie. So what are you hearing about the government's strategy on this? Well, they're certainly working hard, Adrian. They, they're trying to come up with a solution. They've been doing that all weekend. Part of it seems to be about building a coalition of players who are all on the same page as the government. That's why this morning you saw the chief of the AFN, three Mohawk Grand Chiefs, all calling for the situation to de-escalate, finding a way for the Mohawks blocking those rail tracks to be able to walk away and sort of save face, knowing they were heard. It also happened later with the opposition uh, leaders, with the exception of Andrew Scheer, as you heard there. All of the progressive parties inside the House now are on the same 
same page for how this needs to end, meaning through talk, and Sheer sort of left out of the situation entirely. What you didn't hear today, though, was any talk of timelines. It's believed that that would sort of inflame the situation. It's fair to say the government knows this can't go on forever because of those real economic consequences. So the focus right now is primarily on trying to get a meeting with the Wet'suwet'en, and once they have that commitment, the hope is to negotiate something there that would get the blockades down. There's a lot happening behind the scenes and not a lot of details about the nature of the negotiations. Okay, so that pressure is not to be underestimated. No, the government's under some really intense pressure, both from the First Nations communities, business, people who want to get their goods moved across the country, from the official opposition, the Conservatives, who see an opportunity here to give voice to some of the people in this country who are running out of patience. The government also doesn't have a whole lot of leverage here, Adrian. Um, so there's pressure, particularly on the Prime Minister, who has made reconciliation his calling card, again today, talked about the willingness for all sides to find a solution. It's not clear what happens if the government fails, though. What, what is the other solution? But they believe that if they succeed, they can certainly point to this as proof that things can be done differently, differently and that reconciliation does matter. All right, Rosie, thanks very much. Thanks. Via Rail says some of the many passenger trains cancelled because of the blockade near Belleville, Ontario, will start running again on Thursday. That includes the busy corridors of Toronto, London, Windsor, and Ottawa, Montreal, Quebec City. So Via is losing money by the day. CN is laying off workers. And today, business leaders added to the pressure on Ottawa to fix this fast. As Jacqueline Hansen tells us, manufacturers say there's not much time before the situation becomes dire. From food production to store shelves, getting products from A to B is now much more difficult. This issue uh, is beyond serious. It's, it's critical. The Canadian Manufacturers and Exporters Group is trying to get the federal government's attention. It wants rail service restored as soon as possible. We're fearful that we're going to start seeing companies announcing uh, shutdowns or layoffs. Each day train service is disrupted, the group estimates $425 million worth of goods are sitting idle. One economist says it could cost the economy between 60 and $160 million per week. Almost everything we buy that's a physical good has probably got some ingredient, some component that comes from either another province or one of Canada's international trading partners. While trains are at a standstill, the exporters group is asking for emergency funding for workers who are laid off and for companies that are in trouble. Maple Leaf Foods is one of the major food producers that relies on the rail network to ship perishable products such as meat. Please allow me to emphasize the word perishable. Timely access to transportation is absolutely critical in our business and to our ability to feed people in North America and abroad. RCMP, stand down! RCMP, stand down! The political disruption could also have a longer economic impact if Canada's reputation as a place to do business takes another hit. What investors want, what companies want is predictability. Uh, right today, it, we don't look so good. So, 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 so Yet more pressure on the government to get both the country's trains and the economy back on track. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. And tomorrow, even more pressure. Saskatchewan Premier Scott Moe tweeted tonight he has arranged a conference call tomorrow with his fellow provincial leaders. Moe said he was prompted by what he called a lack of federal leadership in addressing this ongoing illegal activity. The delayed flight to bring home Canadians quarantined on the Diamond Princess cruise ship is now expected to leave Japan on Friday and desperation is growing. 43 Canadian passengers have now tested positive for the coronavirus. And as Sasha Petrosik tells us, the sick won't be allowed to leave, which is tearing one couple apart. For more than 200 Canadians aboard the Diamond Princess, these last days of their quarantine have been full of anticipation and frustration, waiting for one final round of test results for a rescue flight promised by Ottawa rescheduled and so we're back to square one so not happy not very disappointed very stressful and it's not a good feeling but it was nothing like the shock delivered to greg garex when two men in hazmat suits showed up at his cabin door today 
You have the coronavirus, they said. Get ready to go to hospital. I don't know how I got it. I don't know where I got it. His wife, Rose, is virus-free, bound for home, while Greg is banned from flying. How he can be positive and, and me negative when we've been sharing everything. I talked to them just a few minutes after the news. So what are you thinking right now? How are you feeling? Scared. I don't want to go into the Japanese medical system. Our plane is like a day away, and I'm gonna, not going to be on it, and my wife is. I'm going to be alone. And I'm scared. Rose blames Ottawa for a last-minute airlift that left two weeks for Greg to catch the virus. If the Canadian government had done this sooner, we wouldn't be having this problem. She faces two more weeks of quarantine in Canada while he goes for treatment here. It's tough, eh? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Okay, so Sasha, it's been a long wait for the flight. What do we know about its status now? Well, Ottawa blames these delays on what it calls unforeseen technical issues. And, Andrew, there could be more of them. Uh, this morning here in Japan, on board the ship, the captain announced that the Canadian flight will be further delayed until Friday morning. Now, by that point, uh, the quarantine on board the ship will be over. That's the plan. And many others will also be leaving. Those who are uninfected will be getting on planes to Hong Kong, Australia and Italy. And others, of course, will be just walking off the ship into Japan. Andrew? Okay, thanks very much, Sasha. Now, it's unclear how many of the 256 Canadian passengers will be on the evacuation flight. But when they arrive, they'll all face another quarantine period here. Each person will be assessed on their own symptomology. They'll be tested to see if they actually have the virus. And then a decision will be made through the chief public health officer about the best appropriate quarantine for them, depending on their circumstances. So health examinations will happen at Canadian Forces Base Trenton, where Canadians airlifted from China have been staying. Quarantine passengers then head to a hotel in Cornwall, Ontario. Donald Trump falsely declared himself America's top cop and announced nearly a dozen pardons and clemencies. Susan Ormiston's story tonight is on his controversial choices, the cheats, the fraudsters, and a politician so famously corrupt he made international headlines. President Trump was magnanimous today, granting clemency to 11, mostly convicted of corruption, including this man, former Illinois Governor Rod Blagojevich, who was caught on a wiretap soliciting bribes, including trying to sell then-President Obama's vacant Senate seat. I mean, I, I've got this thing, and it's golden. And I, I'm just not giving it up for nothing. Lagojevich was impeached, convicted, and eight years into a 14-year prison term. Trump called the sentence ridiculous. He served eight years in jail. It's a long time, and uh, I watched his wife on television. She was on for a short while of The Apprentice years ago. Uh, seemed like a very nice person. Don't know him, but... I have years ago, he had given Blagojevich the boot on The Apprentice. But Rod, you're fired. Ten others got their sentences commuted or were pardoned, including an ex-commissioner of New York's police guilty of tax fraud, a former NFL owner guilty in a gambling scheme, whose supporters visited the White House today. You know, I take my hat off to Donald Trump for what he did. Also, Michael Milken, the junk bond king in the 1980s, guilty of violating U.S. securities laws. He paid a big price, paid a very tough price. Trump has been doubling down on a persistent pattern of inserting his power into high-profile U.S. justice cases. I'm actually, I guess, the chief law enforcement officer of the country. Notably with his friend Roger Stone, convicted of lying to Congress and witness tampering. Last week, Trump attacked the jury, the judge, and the prosecutors over their sentencing recommendation. It was overruled and they quit. Stone's actual sentence will be delivered this Thursday. So might he get the same kind of judicial forgiveness? I haven't given it any thought. Contradicting others who say Stone is very much on the president's mind. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Washington. 
Well, the jury deliberated for the first day today at Harvey Weinstein's sex assault trial. Accusations against the former movie mogul led to the Me Too movement, but the judge has told the jury that can't be a factor when deciding Weinstein's fate. Our Stephen D'Souza was in court today. Harvey Weinstein arrived in court with his fate set to be determined by the jury of seven men and five women. He didn't take the stand during the trial, so the jury had to look at the words of his accusers. The prosecution relied on dramatic, often emotional testimony from two women. Miriam Haley, who said Weinstein forced her into a sex act in 2006. And Jessica Mann, an aspiring actress, she said Weinstein raped her in 2013. We don't have the forensics or the DNA or the video evidence that some juries like to see, so really it comes down to who does this jury believe. The prosecution also had gripping testimony from former Sopranos actress Annabella Sciorra. She described in painful detail how Weinstein raped her more than 25 years ago. Past the statute of limitations, the prosecution used it to support predatory sexual assault charges tied to Mann and Haley's accusations. If found guilty on either, he faces up to life in prison. But the prosecution's biggest challenge, Mann's complicated relationship with Weinstein. The defense brought evidence of emails, text messages, phone calls, not just right after the alleged assault, but years after the alleged assault against her to indicate, look, this is, was a relationship. This was consensual. One thing the jury can't consider, the message the verdict would send to women in boardrooms across the country. The judge has said this isn't a referendum on the Me Too movement. Weinstein's lead attorney made that point in a recently published op-ed. The direct plea to the jury to ignore media noise drew the ire of the judge and prosecution. I think it was ill-advised. I think I see it as an act of desperation to try to appeal to the jury. In just over five hours of deliberation, the jury asked to review some evidence, including a list of women that Weinstein had red flagged and wanted private investigators to look into just before the Me Too scandal broke. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. Dealing with a sex abuse scandal of its own, the Boy Scouts of America has filed for bankruptcy protection. By filing bankruptcy, you're admitting that in all probability you're going to be liable for these victims, these documented victims, and it's going to cost you a great deal of money. The Scouts are expecting between one and 5,000 victims to come forward, and they're setting up a fund of up to a billion dollars to compensate them. Some of that money will come from the group's property holdings. Meanwhile, the organization does intend to continue operating. Concerns over what Ontario's new license plates look like at night. Wow, you really can't see that. Up next, the criticism from police and the response from the province. Plus, the common household products linked to childhood asthma. You think you're keeping a clean environment when actually you're not doing yourself any favors, are you? We're in 238. Yeah, go in the front, we'll do that. And rare access inside the fight against sex trafficking with a survivor now on the front lines with police. You see people's eyes light up, um, even for a second, you know, and, and that to me is, that's hope. We're back in two minutes. Welcome back. A license plate redesign in Ontario has some police officers raising concerns. The big complaint, you just can't read the plates at night. As Sarah Levitt shows us today, that put the provincial government on the defensive. Look, you can read that one, but what the f is that? Ontario's brand new license plates have only been on the streets for a couple of weeks and already there's a major complaint. Wow, you really can't see that. From a Kingston police officer, they're virtually unreadable at night. Others call the plates invisible and glowing. The Ontario Association of Chiefs of Police say it's hearing complaints from frontline officers. We've heard from a number of them saying that uh, the new plates uh, are causing some issues, particularly with visibility at night. This reflectivity issue, this is sort of novel. For David Steckley, who has a collection of over 10,000 plates from around the world, the government's tests failed. Speaking as a motorist and not a collector who maybe views these as collector's items, uh, we would want the best that the ministry could offer. I would want to know that anybody could read my number in a snap. The Ontario government says they tested the plates for readability, reflectivity and functionality. And what is the plan to fix the plates? <laughs> In the Ontario legislature today, the opposition went on the attack. 
and I thought Ontario was a place to grow, not a place to glow. But again, I would like to know what this Premier plans to do to fix these plates and keep us safe. The redesign with the brand new slogan announced last year was slammed by critics and labeled a conservative branded license plate. Our plates are readable. The status quo, the flaking and peeling liberal plates were not an option to stick with. Ontarians deserved better and we're delivering on that. Despite the complaints, the government is sticking with the plates, at least for now. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Toronto. Well, now to some of the other stories we are watching across Canada tonight. Nearly 70,000 federal public servants caught up in the Phoenix pay system debacle are now victims of a privacy breach. Government officials say their personal information was accidentally emailed to the wrong people. So we're talking names, employee ID numbers, home addresses, and payroll figures. The problem-plagued electronic payroll system has improperly paid tens of thousands of people since its launch in 2016. An Air Canada plane bound for Toronto was forced to declare a mid-air emergency after losing one of its main landing wheels. Passengers were seen disembarking after the plane landed safely. However, you can clearly see damage to one of the plane's rear landing wheels, which apparently happened during takeoff from New York. 120 passengers and five crew members were on board. The airline says there were no injuries. And two people are recovering in hospital on Vancouver Island after a plane crash north of Victoria this morning. Now, incredibly, the pilot and passenger managed to walk away with just minor injuries. Authorities say an oil leak caused heavy smoke, which obstructed the pilot's view and forced an emergency landing. The Transportation Safety Board is now investigating. The nominations are out for this year's Canadian Screen Awards and a CBC sitcom is at the front of the pack. Buongiorno, boys. <laughs> Say hello to all my new hashtag friends. Schitt's Creek leads the pack with a record-breaking 26 nominations. Not far behind is CBC's drama series and with an E, which picked up 17 nods of its own. In total, CBC has 267 nominations, including 29 in news categories. The awards will be handed out on March 29th. And tonight, we have rare access for you as police battle one of the fastest growing crimes in Canada, human trafficking. In your opinion, how did that go? That's the type of meeting that I think is a success. This woman is their secret weapon next to a survivor who has now joined police to help others. And later, the simple changes around the house that could decrease your kid's risk of developing asthma. We'll be right back. Human trafficking, which is often linked to the sex trade, is sustained by secrecy, shame and suspicion. Police know they are only ever seeing a piece of it, glimpses of a modern-day slavery thriving in the shadows of cities and towns across the country. But in Ontario, one police unit has its own secret weapon. And with unprecedented access, Ioana Romiliotis saw her in action. A warning, this is an inside look at a world that can be difficult and disturbing to see. How much is the price, Chappie? 200 an hour, buddy. You can see 22, 19, 22. They're all different ages. We're looking for younger looking females right now. The stories behind the images are sickening. On the board, that girl looks young and she said they're offering duo. 613? The 613 number? Yeah. Leila? Young women, half of them underage, trapped in the sex trade. Durham Police's Human Trafficking Unit is trying to find them and trying to show them a way out. They can kind of give us clues where they are. So like Westney Road 401, Ajax, Whitby, Carly helps out and gives their opinion and we work together and try to find somebody and go talk to them. Carly Church knows what to look yes. for because she used to be in one of those ads. Oh, I did see Kendall. Yeah, that was the first one you guys okay, looked yeah, at. Now she's the unit's secret weapon, one of the few human trafficking survivors to be embedded with a Canadian police force. Most people who are being trafficked, there's a part of you that's like, is there another option? Or when I was involved, like if somebody came and said, there's somebody here that can talk to you, uh, totally confidential, um, you know, nothing comes back to the police, you can have a conversation with her in complete privacy. I would have taken that opportunity for sure. Carly works for Victim Services of Durham Region. Two years ago, she and Detective Dave Davies joined forces to help victims escape sexual exploitation. Dave runs the unit. He calls her number seven. 
We have six people in our unit and we include her as seven. Even though she works for victim services, we still, she's part of our team. We're making contact, we're providing them with support and assistance right then, there's no delay. And they see that like we're there for them 100% and we're not interested in judging you, we're literally here if you need anything ever. That's what I mean, you guys decide who's going to help. We need four to the door though, so. Human trafficking or sex trafficking yeah. is one of the fastest growing crimes in Canada. We'll talk about that. Uh, the majority of victims are Canadian and female. We'll Police that, uh, typically uh, answer ads posing as clients to find potential victims. We're we going out this way? Yeah. But Dave says it was tough to build a rapport until Carly started coming along. Okay, I'll be there. I'm just uh, by the Wallies. On this day, Police will answer two ads. Both lead to hotel rooms nearby. They never know what to expect, but always start with an offer of help. We went and saw a girl last week, and the first thing I said is, I don't want to hear your story right now. I said, I want to make sure that you're safe for one. Um, do you need to go to the hospital? Do you need anything medically? We're, we're, we we want to, we care. And then Carly will do her piece after that. Room 238. Yeah, go in the front, we'll do that. Just her room. So he usually goes in separately. Once at the hotel, officers go in first. They're undercover and why we can't reveal their identities. They're securing the scene. Pimps sometimes hide in bathrooms or in adjoining rooms, and they can be armed. When it's safe, Carly can follow and tell whoever is behind that door. She too was once in a hotel room just like this one. And with Durham Police, I'd like to talk to you. So my name's Carly. Oh, I'm actually a survivor of domestic sex trafficking. I had a pimp, um, and he forced me to work in the sex trade. Um, Carly's so painful past is now years. her power um, and part of Durham's bigger um, strategy to raise awareness. I was in a new city and didn't even know where I was. She shares her story at dozens of schools in the region and warns students traffickers prey on any vulnerability. Um, he is looking for somebody who maybe is being bullied in school. He's looking for somebody who maybe doesn't have that brand name, uh, brand name clothing or brand new iPhone. Carly says they go on to shower girls with praise and gifts. We see that about 85% of people that we work with identify their trafficker to be their boyfriend. So it actually feels in this stage like you are in a loving relationship. It feels as if you have hit the jackpot, as if you have found your dream man. Once hooked, victims are manipulated and coerced into the sex trade. It's shocking how many of the students relate to Carly's story. Almost every presentation I have ever done, somebody has come up after and made a disclosure either this has happened to me, I think this is happening to me, or I know somebody that this is happening to. So that's like young people who had no idea that what was happening to them um, was wrong. Disturbing to say police, how many teenagers end up brutalized in a matter of weeks. Are there any cases that you've had that really stick with you, either because they were really disturbing or...? Lots of them. Can you talk about them? Um, there's incidents with girls getting waterboarded, uh, eating their own feces, um, being raped by, by massive dildos. Um, there's, it's very, there's so many. Um, it can be overwhelming and exhausting but they're determined. Back at the hotel, Dave and Carly get the okay to come up. The young woman in the room wants to talk to Carly. Most of them do. Dave and the team wait outside. It can take a while. The bond between pimp and victim is twisted, and undercover officers say it's hard to untangle. They believe that these people actually care about them. Police have the right to take away underage girls, but when the young women are 18 and over, the job gets a lot harder. They've been so manipulated into this. It's not that easy. We wish it was that easy, because we would take her right now. But building trust is a slow process, and it's complicated. Victims depend on their pimps for survival, for food, shelter, and they're often dealing with trauma and substance abuse. Carly's inside uh, talking to the female inside there and just uh, uh, connecting with her with the resources. 
We're just waiting for her to finish. Any findings? Or? Not yet. Um, we'll wait and have a debrief at the end and kind of get all the information before uh, uh, we speak about what's happening. Yeah. 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 See you later. Bye. Bye. You're good, thank you. So, do you want to just give a debrief on what she said? She wants to be here. The woman back in the hotel was young, but old enough to stay. She could be any one of their daughters, and Dave says that makes it personal. What does that do to you guys as human beings? Well, I think it just it makes you realize that, you know, there's more to policing than just the negative part of it arresting people and charging. There's always the positive part of finding a girl that's underage and helping her and getting her home, finding a missing girl that's in a hotel. That's where they find rewarding. Um, and it's great. When you find one, everybody's ecstatic and we're like taking them home, take them to parents. You know, it's, it's, re it's rewarding. The woman they left at the hotel didn't want to leave, but there's already a sign she might. She's already sent me a text message after we left the room. She's aware that we're here to help in any way, so. In your opinion, how did that go? That's the type of meeting that I think is a success. For me, a win isn't somebody just leaving with us. A win is building a relationship and building a rapport. So if this is something that's not something she wants to do for the rest of her life, whether she's doing it independently or if she's being trafficked, um, she now knows that there's a resource that can um, offer other options. How's it going? Hi, good, how are you? Okay, everybody, we're going to get started. The strategy here is to coordinate resources for victims. Carly and Dave meet regularly with Durham's Human Trafficking Coalition. Is there any way that they can sign up as landlords that would be willing to rent to our clients? They advocate for everything from safe housing to passes to amusement parks. Sometimes it's just about delivering a bit of joy. One day as I was working with a client and she actually said, like, I just want to be a kid again. She's 16. She's still a kid and doesn't have the ability to do those things at this point. Um, and her childhood has been kind of stripped from her because she's been working in the sex trade since she was 14. Meantime, another hotel room, another conversation, another young woman not ready to leave, at least not yet. But now, there's a good chance she will. See you later. Twice as many victims have come forward to police since the new strategy was adopted. And the ones who aren't ready to go that far are still reaching out to Carly. She's now supporting 240 trafficking survivors. The number has doubled in the last two years. You're your own success story, so what do you want to leave with them? I just want them to know that there is hope, that there is something else. Even if you've been in it for a short period of time, it feels like this is your life. Um, that the, the mountain is too large to climb. Um, so to be able to sit there and share with them that, you know, six years ago I was there with you, like I was there in the same spot as you, um, and now I actually get to come in here and, and talk to you. Um, you know, you see people's eyes light up, um, even for a second, you know, and, and that to me is, that's hope. As for Dave, his instinct as an officer and a father is to bring someone home safely. Tonight, he's driving back alone. I'm calling it a night? Yeah, we're gonna head back to the office. And the guys have a bunch of meetings tomorrow and follow-ups and <laughs> never end. But he knows a call for help could come weeks, even months after a night like this. And right now, that's enough. Did you ever get discouraged? No, not at all. Joanna Rumeliotis, CBC News, Oshawa, Ontario. You heard the victims in these cases are often vulnerable and very young. So up next on The National, we'll talk with a mother who rescued her own daughter from a human trafficking ring. The signs parents can watch for right after the break. So in the fight against human trafficking, we just saw how trauma can lead to trust, how powerful someone can be when armed with their own experience. And that goes for parents, too. We would say, I love you all the time. We would, we we're a very affectionate family. But I don't think what we said enough was, I love you no matter what. So Linda Harlow speaks with parents every chance she gets, warning them human trafficking can happen in any home to any one of their kids. She knows because her daughter Sam was trafficked by her boyfriend. And Linda had no idea. 
Now she does what she can to raise awareness to help parents protect their kids. And Linda Harlos is with us now to try to do just that. So what you know now could really be critical for other parents. So can you help us with the red flags that maybe you miss that, that other parents need to be watching for? I think what we need to understand is that our kids can have some vulnerabilities that we may not be privy to. And we need to start looking for those signs of where our child is starting to kind of pull away from us or they've got a new set of friends, or they're doing something different with their hair, the way they're, they're functioning. So if you know your children, which most of us do, you're going to see those signs very, very quickly that something's not right. And with Samantha, she, because she had been raped, she also felt very ostracized in the community, and she felt like she'd lost a lot of friends. So it became very easy for somebody to target her and give her those things that she thought she really needed, which was friendship and a good life. And so as, as a parent or as a guardian, Knowing that, what can you actually do to shield your kids from this? There's a few things that you need to do. My, you know, her boyfriend lured her away from the, or tried to lure her away from the, the family by doing what he could to cause fights. And uh, he was promising her a lifestyle that uh, she really wanted, which was a, a big family. We did what we could to just try to keep lines of communication open because we understood that something wasn't right, but we couldn't pin what it was because we didn't know what human trafficking was. Educating yourself is a, is a huge thing on this, um, which is my goal. But the other um, thing that you need to do is make sure that your lines of communication are open about the sex topics. And I know sometimes those are difficult to have with your kids. But if you're ready and willing to talk about those difficult conversations, they're going to know that they can come and talk to you about those questions that they have. And those questions might be vital questions that will give you a huge key of whether or not there's something wrong that's going on in your life. And lastly, you just got to make sure that your kids know without a shadow of a doubt that you love them. And you can't just say, I love you. You need to say, I love you no matter what. And what about Sam now? How's she doing? She's doing great. Um, my grandson is 11, and she's been married for two and a half years. She works for victim services, going around to schools, talking about this to the younger, to the younger kids. As a victim, she understands and can really portray that. And uh, she's hoping to become a police officer and work in this department. Fantastic. Well, she's got a great mom. Thank you. All right. Thank you. While police and parents work to protect victims, Thomas Degler got a rare glimpse at a little-known unit tracking the financial trail traffickers leave behind. A little over $30,000 is deposited into Stella's account. That money is flowing through Stella's account into Jim's account. These are human trafficking indicators. He thinks he's keeping an arm's length away when in reality the money tells a different story. And the story the money tells tomorrow. On the national. Up next, though, the cleaning products that could put kids at a higher risk of health problems. It's not just what's in these cleaners, but how they're being used. When we come back, the risks and the simple solutions. Welcome back. We're following several other stories from around the world tonight, starting in Syria. The sheer quantity of, of attacks on these hospitals, medical facilities, schools would suggest they, they can't all be accidental. So that is the UN suggesting the Syrian government deliberately targeted civilians in recent attacks. Officials say nearly 300 people have been killed so far this year alone in the ongoing war in Syria. The UN Human Rights Office says 93 percent of those civilian deaths were caused by the Syrian government and its allies. And in the UK, several warnings are still in place as people deal with the deluge brought by Storm Dennis. Evacuations are underway in towns along rivers. There are over 100 flood warnings still in place across the country. The storm killed three people in Britain. More rain is expected in parts of the country later this week. And in the United States, new drone images out today reveal the scale of flooding along the Pearl River in Jackson, Mississippi. Several flood watches and warnings are in place across the southern U.S. Millions of people are under states of emergency in Mississippi and Alabama. And there's more rain in the forecast for the region. Well, parents know how important it is to keep a home clean. But now there's evidence that some cleaners may be hurting their children. A new study found frequent exposure can increase kids' risk of developing asthma. Karen Pauls looks at the problem and some potential solutions. So first thing, you just got to get your nose clip on. Okay. Nine-year-old Laura Zucchelli comes in every few years for a battery of tests. Deep breath, deep breath, deep breath. 
Blast! Perfect. All the way to the six. Keep going. Diagnosed going, with asthma as a toddler, you she deals with the limitations awesome every job. day. Sometimes when I'm running, it's, it gets hard to breathe. And so then I have to stop and take a break. And most of the time I can't participate in sports that I would like to. Researchers have crunched some of the data provided by Zucchelli and more than 2,000 other children across Canada. They found by the age of three, nearly 8% of children living in homes where cleaning supplies were used frequently had asthma. That's compared to 5% diagnosed from homes that use low amounts of products. That includes air fresheners, antimicrobial hand sanitizers, dish and laundry detergent and oven cleaners. The relationship between exposure and respiratory problems is higher for girls than boys. We need to think more about the products that we're using in our homes around children. They really should be products uh, without a lot of chemicals, if any chemicals, and certainly uh, fragrance is a no-no. The findings suggest small changes could help reduce the risk of asthma. For example, avoiding air fresheners and anything you spray into the air. So it's not just what's in these cleaners, but how they're being used. Um, and the sprayed and aerosolized products are particularly an area that we want to focus on. But it's often not so easy to figure it out. Canadian and American manufacturers don't have to list the ingredients on consumer cleaning products. Compare that to the European Union, where labels have to warn if there are potential toxic ingredients. Kind of ironic, isn't it? You think you're keeping a clean environment when actually you're not doing yourself any favours, are you? Michael Zucchelli wishes he'd known this when Laura was a baby. Instead of using spray bottles or aerosol, which I typically don't, but uh, you know, instead of spraying onto a window with Windex, for instance, or a mirror or something, just put onto a cloth instead and, and clean it that way. That way Nothing's getting in the air. Suck it in, suck it in, hold your breath. One. The two, good news four, is that most five, children five, outgrow their five, asthma five, symptoms five, by the time they get to school. Did it work? Yeah. You feel a difference already? Karen awesome. Pauls, CBC News, Vancouver. We'll be right back with tonight's moment. 18 years after she entered this world in a hurry and in a really interesting place, a Vancouver teen heads back to the pub where she was born to mark another milestone. That's next. Well, having your first legal drink can be a bit of a milestone, but for Isabel Casey, equally important was where it happened. She wanted to take that first drink where she took her first breath. Now, that happened in a pub in England when her mom went into labor while having coffee with friends. So for her 18th birthday, that is where Casey went and all the way from Vancouver too, where she lives now. Her trip down memory lane is our moment tonight. 18 years ago, my mom was just at the pub before um, a nursing shift with friends getting coffee and she wanted to labor. Uh, it was my dad's plan and I to go back because uh, we wanted to see family. Obviously, it's a cool story. I made it when I was born. So uh, it was a Green King IPA. It's what my dad grew up on. But we have a lot of family friends there. So I keep in contact with friends and uh, all my relatives. It was interesting because I saw photos, so I've been in there since I was one, so it's nice to picture it all together with the photos. It was fun because I've been on the news before, so it's kind of nice to have like the interviews there. But it was definitely chaotic and a lot of uh, new experiences. <laughs> I have a lot of questions about this, but I, but I quite like that she says that this birth story has always been her cool party trick. <laughs> right. But I, and I mean, you know, the, the, the big question being, you know, what did she think of the, of beer? the beer? And, and you know, she said it was a, an interesting experience, I think was the word that she used, which, and I, you know, it's I can't imagine that anyone... Endorsement. Yeah, exactly, right? I can't imagine someone would, would have their first pint of beer and think this tastes delicious, because it, it never tastes delicious, <laughs> not, at least not the first time. I think it's more of an acquired taste. Uh, that's The National for this February 18th. Have a good night. Good night.